Hi everyone, today we're going to take a look at focus stacking. What it is, how to do it, is it purely the preserve of macro photography? Um, what sort of apertures to choose, everything. It, to some people it's just an everyday technique that they're very familiar with. You probably won't be watching this video. For others it's something they've heard of, never yet had a go at and really want to try. Um, so I'm going to take you through a few of the various uh, focus stacking techniques and hopefully that'll help you. Okay guys, so let's take a look at focus stacking. First question has to be asked, why do we need to focus stack? Well, let's just go through a few little things. Number one question I get asked uh, is something like, John, I've just bought a new macro lens, I can't get sharp photos. John, I've just bought a new macro lens, I can't get an update of the field. So why don't we just use a small aperture, a large F number, to get a huge depth of field. And the problem there is it doesn't always work in the in macro situations. What we're going to look now is at macro situations more than anything. We'll go on to focus stacking landscapes later. So let's start with looking at where people go wrong and get confused with macro photography. Easiest way to do that, look at a few photos at different apertures. Something really exciting here is a tape measure. Now the Nikon 105mm f3.5 macro lens goes from f3.5 to f32, but the effective aperture, as you focus closer, that effective aperture gets smaller, it goes from f5 to f57. Yes, I did say f57. And you get that readout in the viewfinder and you get that readout with the EXIF data. I think it only happens with the Nikon lenses. I don't think Canon, Sony's give the effective aperture. They just give the, the set aperture. So at f5, focused at the 10 centimeter mark on this tape measure. Now that the, the zero isn't set anywhere like the, the lens or anything, it's just, I moved it around until the 10 came in focus. It kind of made sense. You can see the 10 centimeter mark is in focus. The one millimeter marks either side of that, they're not even in focus. So your depth of field is incredibly small. Let's stop down to f11. We've got maybe two millimetres of depth of field at f11. Let's go to f22. We may have six or seven or eight millimetres of depth of field at f22. Let's go all the way to f32. We've got a little bit more, maybe, yeah, almost a centimetre. Not quite. Keep going to f57. And it's about a centimetre and a half, two centimetres, but it's not bitingly crisp. This was shot on a tripod on a subject that doesn't move and it's not 100% crisp. Why? It's diffraction. At these tiny, tiny apertures you do start getting a little bit of diffraction affecting the photo. So you're better off at the F32s or even the F22s or even the F11s. You can see how crisp that is. Now, if I wanted to get this in focus over about a five centimetre spread, I can't do it in a single exposure. And I have to take one and then another and then another and another and another and another at slightly different focus points and then stack them all together in the computer to get that result. That's what focus stacking is. Let's have a look at it in practice. I'm going to do this focus stack entirely manually. I've got the lens set to manual focus here and I'm focusing somewhere around this part of the tape measure. And then I'm going to just move back in stages. So what we're going to end up is a series of slices of photograph that are in focus and we piece them together afterwards in Photoshop. Technique's relatively straightforward. I like to use manual focus rather than playing around with um, autofocus and moving the focus points because that can jog the camera, move the tripod head, anything like that. And it is just, if you watch my fingers on the focus ring here, you'll see it's just the tiniest movement. In 
terms of distance here, we're working at a reasonable aperture. We've got f11 on this. And there we have a series of photos. I was moving no more than about half a centimetre, just under half a centimetre probably at this end. Because at f11, as we've seen, the depth of field is pretty tiny. Now let's take those, put them together in Photoshop. OK, so let's take a look here. We've got Focus Shift Shooting. It's on the Photo Shooting menu on the Nikon Z6 and Nikon Z7. Effectively, it is automatic focus bracketing. It doesn't put them together in the camera. It just gives you a series of raw files that you can stack afterwards. Um, and I prefer to have that amount of control over it anyway. So let's go into Focus Shift Shooting. Uh, and we've got a few stages here. Um, let's start at the top. Number of shots. Pretty straightforward. It runs, you can see here, from 1 to 300, so you can set a focus stack from 1, totally impractical, that's just a photo, single photo, all the way up to 300, and it'll move that focus point each time. When would you need 300? If you're trying to get a huge depth of field, absolute maximum aperture on a very long lens, uh, or if you're an extreme macro subject, and I'm talking about five, six times magnification. For most people, you're not going to need numbers that high. Uh, I've got 17 set on this anyway and I'm going to stick with that because it kind of works for me. Um, focus step width. This is a little odd in some ways because it runs from narrow to wide and, it, and it's just it comes across as very imprecise. It's a little bit just judgmental and if we look at the uh, wide end it runs from 1 to 10. And at the wide end, it just moves the focus a little bit further from the close focus point through to infinity each time. That's the way it takes. You, you focus at the closest point you can, and then each step goes closer and closer to infinity. Um, if you set too many stages and fairly wide, once it reaches infinity, it will stop shooting in any case. At the narrow end, needless to say, it's, it's only going to move the focus a fraction a small stage you would need to use you could use wide let's say you're using a wide angle lens at f22 uh, on something that's not necessarily that close maybe a couple of feet away you could easily stack wide um, segments narrow segments would be much more useful if you're on a longer lens at a wider aperture uh, and you're trying to and it's fairly close to you and you're trying to stack that together. So let's start with narrow at two. Interval until next shot. I don't need a, a gap here, so I'll just set it at zero. Um, these are peaking stack images. This is quite an interesting one because it does show you uh, a peaking image at the end. It's, it comes, it looks a little bit like a negative and uh, it comes across and shows you um, how much is in focus. And silent photography, I got set it on because that uses the electronic shutter. It causes less vibration because there's no mechanical shutter firing. It's also nice and quiet. Um, means you won't hear anything though while we're videoing this. Uh, and it's dead easy. It's currently focused at, let's just go back to where we are. It's currently focused down here at about seven mil. There you go around about seven centimetres along that uh, ruler. Go back into photo shift shooting, press start. You can press start either just by touching that or pressing OK on the back of the camera. And here it goes, it's preparing and it will start to shoot now. And it's now piecing them together. You can see the focus point has moved a little further on and it's now going to show you this, which is the peaking stack image. It only comes up for a couple of seconds. Um, I wish it came up for longer, but hey ho. So we're now focused back at uh, seven centimetres. So we'll come back out there, have a look at that. We'll go back into the menu, we'll go back into focus shift shooting. This time we're going to use a focus step width of 10. And we're going to go up to start, press that. These are larger segments. So what I'm expecting here 
is more of that tape measure to be in focus. Um, it'll be interesting when we piece it together to see if we've got each focus link working, uh, actually intersecting with the next one uh, and overlapping as we want. You can see how far that's gone. It's gone all the way to the back of the tape measure and that's how much we've got in focus. I see little dark bands through there and I wonder if we've got smooth focus all the way through or if we've got a bit in focus, then a bit out of focus, then a bit in focus, then a bit out of focus. We'll take those, we'll download them into Photoshop, we'll uh, stack them up together and we'll see what the whole thing looks like. Okay guys, so now I've opened up Photoshop and we're going to take those photos which we shot, we downloaded to Lightroom. I've actually selected them and stuck them in a subdirectory so it's easy to find them. Um, you don't need to do that. Uh, we're going to load them into a stack, which is like a book. And then we're going to isolate the bits that we need to see from each layer. I'll explain as we go along. It's a very simple process. Within Photoshop, you go to the first drop down menu, which is file. Click on that and you can drop down. Down below automate to scripts. Um, I would have thought it was an automatic system, but apparently you're writing a script. That's all my IT friends tell me. Uh, and under scripts, you will see down here, load files into stack. Just click on that. And I'm just going to show you how to put one of these together. The principle is the same. And then we'll compare the various different um, ones that we put together uh, in the earlier part of the video. You'll see with this dialog box that pops up, the only thing that, that I'm not greyed out here is browse. Had I already opened the files in Photoshop, I could have added the open files. But this way, I'm just going to find them first, piece them together, or we'll load them together and then join them up. Um, this was the stack we did on the Z6 with the stacking gap set at 10, that widest gap of all. Um, it might be an interesting one to look at. So we click on there, which is the first. We hold the scroll down, hold the shift key down and click on there, which is the last. It's the same way as pretty well everything on computers. Just click on the first file, shift key, click on the last file and it selects the whole batch. Uh, we click on OK and it comes back to our dialog box. It will take about two or three seconds to load those into that dialog box. There they are. And everything else is uh, ungrade effectively. We have a box here, attempt to automatically align source images. Must admit the word attempt does fill me with total confidence. Not, he's never got it wrong. Will do now. Uh, really important that you tick that box. Uh, I'll explain as it's loading the files. Uh, below there's a, another tick box, create smart object after loading layers. That relates to re-editing the layers after you've um, done the work or going back to your originals. Not part of this video, we might do one on smart objects uh, at a later date. Uh, so I've got more selected, I've ticked that uh, align tick box, I'm going to click on OK and allow it to get on with it. What it's now going to do is to load up each of those individual layers, almost like a book. And we're going to have a book of 17 pages, I think there were 17 exposures, 17 pages, uh, and you're only going to be able to see each individual page. Now, what did it mean by aligning the source images? This was taken on a tripod, so they should be aligned, in theory. However, the focal length of a lens is measured at infinity. And as you focus that lens closer, the effective focal lens actually slightly changes. Uh, the angle of view can get slightly wider as you focus closer or get slightly narrower as you focus closer. The thing is, if you've taken a series of photos at slightly different focus points, we're not talking about zooming a lens, nothing like this, but just purely slightly different focus points, they won't line up unless you resize them. So effectively, they all lie on top of one another. So it has now made all the 
put all, all of those layers into a stack, it's now aligning. And you'll see now it has. And we're, the great thing about this is the very, very, very top layer was the closest focus. And you can see we're focused around here. If I switch that layer off, top layer, and the next, and the next, and the next, you can see we're gradually moving forward in focus. Let's turn those back on. If you want to only see, in passing, this is worth covering, if you only want to look at one specific layer, let's say it's this one here, if you put your cursor over the eye on that layer, which indicates the layer visibility, hold the Alt key down, this applies to Macs as well as PCs, click on that, every other layer becomes invisible, it's switched off effectively, and you can only see that one layer. Click on it again, Alt key down, click on it again, everything comes back on. Right, we've got all the layers loaded in Photoshop, so we've got this book of 17 pages. Of course, normally you can only see the top page. There they all are. Click on the top page, top layer. Go down to the bottom. Hold the shift key down. Click on the bottom layer. They're all selected. This time we're doing an edit on that. So we click on edit and we come down to this one here, which says auto blend layers. You'll notice just above it, it says auto align layers. That's a brilliant one if you forgot to tick that tick box when you were stacking them together. Auto blend layers. We're stacking the image as it says here. We're not creating a panorama and we want seamless tones and colors. I'm not going to worry about content affair, uh, aware fill transparent areas. I'll just crop it slightly at the end. Click on OK. That's now going to get on and do it. What it's going to do here is create a separate layer mask for each one of those layers. And on that layer mask, it will select the sharpest elements. So that's all you will see. And it will cut everything else out. Therefore, on the next layer, where the sharp point has moved from there to there, you'll only see that bit. And then there, and there, and there, and there. It generally doesn't do a bad job. So there it is. They're all stacked together. You just take a look at the individual layers here and see what we're adding to it. If we look at that very first layer, there's the sharp bit. Let's add the next, and you can see what it's doing is building up layer by layer. all the way through the photo. Let me show you the rest. Just go down the bottom. Even if we look at this as a pixel size, a stray hair on the background, I didn't even know it was there. Now, if you remember, this was the one we did at the widest gaps that we could on the um, Z6. And looking at it, I can see that it's sharp there, then it's not quite so sharp there, then it's sharper there, and there are little bands that aren't 100% sharp. It's very close. So actually, had I set it to a gap of nine or a gap of eight, I think it would have been perfect. And for most purposes, this, this has surprised me. This is better than I expected it to be. Um, that's one. That's how easy it is. You've still got all the all the layers, and you can, of course, just choose to flatten them. First thing I'm going to do is just take a little crop. I'm just going to crop in a bit at the side, a bit at the base, because you can see there's a blurry bit there where the lens is breathing. A wee bit at that side. A little bit at the top, because again, there's a blurry bit at the top. That's actually how I would have composed that first image anyway, and the others. It just gradually got slightly wider as we got closer. And there we have a depth of field. When you compare that to what we took at F57 or F32, it's got massive, massive depth of field. 
focus stacking, pretty straightforward. Of course, the next thing you want to do to this will be to flatten the image. And on the layers palette, you just click on the end there, and you drop down to flatten image. Boom, done. We'll save that. We'll also, I'll do a focus stack of the um, other one we did with Z6 and one we did manually. And we'll just take a look at the options. Okay, everyone, so let's just take a, a look at the results we've got and how they've worked and how we've pieced them together. I thought I'd start just by showing the, the various layers that Photoshop created on the manually focused um, tape measure shot. This was 13 photos. And I've got each of the 13 layers. Just going to flick through them to show you how they build up. So that's layer one, layer two, three, four, five, six. I won't count anymore. It's interesting you will notice that in the middle of the tape measure there's little bits that it's missed out uh, and astonishingly when it gets to the end it's filled them in with effectively blurred bits but you don't notice and you really don't notice and I don't think that's a bad result and we've got you can see here we've got depth of field from the 10 centimeter mark certainly through to the 17 centimeter mark so we've got a seven centimeter depth of field I know it's it's not looking straight down the tape measure but that's that's probably got three or four centimeter depth of field on that and I was quite pleased with the result Let's move on to the auto stacked ones I did with the Z7. This was the one we did with the focus step width set at two, which meant that the, the refocusing was only a, a very small amount between each um, frame. And it, we started focused at the seven centimeter point. I think the depth of field goes to about 9.5, critically 9.8 perhaps. So we've got 2.8 centimeters of depth of field at F9. Remember when we looked at F11, we had about two, two millimeters of depth of field. So that's done quite a good job. That's 17 shots stacked together that one. When we go to the next shot, this was the one where we set the focus step width to 10, which was huge. Bam, there it is. The background's beautifully sharp. I think most of, if I bring the cursor into play here, I think most of this is brilliantly sharp, but as we get down here, and I, I look at pixel size on it, I can actually see where there's a little bit in focus and then a little bit slightly out and a little bit back in, a little bit slightly out. So the, the focus steps for that at F9 were slightly too big, but that's still quite an impressive demonstration when you see that there's the two, the two step width and that gives you a fairly shallow depth of field. There's the 10 step width, and it gives you an enormous depth of field. That's enough of that. Um, let's look at some photos. I, I haven't put any photos of, of normally stacked um, macro subjects up because you'll find your own subjects. It's easy to do it, but so few, very, very few people realize that focus stacking with landscape photography can be useful. They think, oh, you use a wide angle lens, you take, uh, fairly small apertures and everything's sharp. Uh, I've just popped up to Castle Head, um, which overlooks Dermot Water, and there's this lovely sort of trig point thing in the foreground. I focused on that, and looking at that full screen, the background looks sharp, the whole thing looks sharp. That was shot at f11, optimum aperture. It's on a focal length of about 16 millimeters full frame, so quite a wide angle lens. I would have thought everything would have been sharp, but if we zoom into the background, same photo, if we zoom into the background, you can see it's not, it's far from it. In fact, the foreground's sharp. So I did a uh, seven shot stack set at the, uh, a stack width of four. And I got that. And that looks pretty sharp. In fact, to the casual eye, it looks exactly the same as the first photo. But when we zoom in and we really look at the details on this, and I think you'll find this interesting, I hope you will, that's the background. And that's really sharp. In fact, that only used, I think, four of the seven photos I took. And there's the foreground. The whole thing is sharp front to back. 
I've been able to use a, a good quality aperture f11. I haven't had to stop down to f22 and risk uh, any diffraction. So I, I thought that was quite an interesting thing. And, and then just finally, I thought I'd end another use for focus stacking that people very often forget about is when this is actually taken on an old manual focus Mayer optic lens, because I love the bokeh in the background of this. Uh, but the best bokeh on this lens is achieved at full aperture. At full aperture, I couldn't get those ferns in the foreground sharp. So I focus stacked it. And by focus stacking that, all the ferns are sharp, and that background's got that wonderful, wonderful soft um, result, which I think actually is, is quite an attractive picture and a great use of focus stacking. So there you have it guys, a quick guide to focus stacking both in a macro situation and in landscape photography. It has more uses than people think. It's a fantastic technique, it's not too difficult to do, so get out there and give it a go. Really is fun. Please subscribe to the channel, hopefully I'll see you next time. Thanks, for, thanks very much for watching.